All right, welcome everyone and thank you for joining the New America Fellows Program for this discussion of Daniel Bergner's excellent book, The Mind and the, Mind and the Moon, My Brother's Story, The Science of Our Brains and The Search for Our Psyches. I'm Katie Engelhart, a 2018 New America Fellow and author of The Inevitable. Before we start, a few housekeeping notes. Um, if you have questions during the event, please submit them through the Q&A function and we'll get to them in the second half of the event. Most importantly, copies of The Mind and the Moon are available for purchase through our bookselling partner, Solid State Books. You can find a link to buy the book on this page. Just click buy the book. Daniel Bergner is, as many of you know, a contributing writer for the New York Times Magazine. The Mind and the Moon is his sixth book of narrative nonfiction. His last book, Sing for Your Life, was a New York Times bestseller. And his book about Sierra Leone's civil war in the land of magic soldiers won an overseas press club award. I think to start, Daniel, you were going to read uh, a short excerpt from the introduction of your book to set the stage. So I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Katie. And thanks to the New America Foundation. And thanks to all of you for being here. So. Yeah, this book is both an intellectual exploration about mental health, but also a very, very personal narrative that starts with my brother, who, when we were in our early 20s, was diagnosed as quite severely manic depressive. Uh, so I'm going to read just a little bit from the opening little section of the book. All you really need to know is that he's on a ferry crossing Puget Sound. He's wearing a military jumpsuit with little black dance shoes. And this is the scene. The impact of the rough water against the bow created a steady emphatic beat. And above that, the engine delivered not only a churning rhythm, but something bordering on a melody, deep and ancient, like a Gregorian chant. It was a small part of my brother's gift that he both heard at swelling intensity, this music of water and machinery. And he allowed himself to be inspired and electrified by it. His body responded with a physical, visceral version of a child's wonder as she holds a conch shell to her ear and listens to its elemental communications for the first time. He stood on the lowest deck near the front of the cars and the slung chains as the boat's combination of Gregorian choir and pounding drum surged through him. He lifted one foot to knee height, then leapt high off the other and landed on the first foot so that there was a simultaneous vaulting and transferring of weight, followed by a reversal and more repetition back and forth, melded with the strivings of his torso and arms, amounting to movements at once airborne and sinuous. To the few passengers who watched from their cars, his mix of military jumpsuit and elfin shoes may have looked odd, compounding the oddity of his dancing, but all of this strangeness was countered by the broad solidity of his body and by his resistance to the sporadic lurching of the boat which should have pitched him off balance and made him grab at the chain poles or brace himself against a car, but never did. He hung in the air, stomped his heels on the steel deck, sprang from side to side, spun and elevated again, athletic, animalistic, ethereal, impelled by the pulse of the water and the echoes of medieval worship. And soon, he was on a psychiatric ward with a heavy dose of Haldol seeping into his brain. This is his book, and it is the story of a few of the many who, over the past several years, his story sent me out to find. And then just for a moment more, I want to flash forward. He took himself off medication against psychiatric advice because as a musician, particularly as a pianist, he couldn't perform and play because of the side effects of medication. And two arrests and a further hospitalization later, uh, he was homeless 
And this is his voice describing that experience. On the days I didn't work, I lined up for dinner outside a church across from the shelter. That was something. The guys who slept next to me, who spent their days in the park, they wandered over and we all waited on the street to get in, waited to be fed. We filed into the church basement and took plates of spaghetti and chunks of bread. The basement was too crowded for anyone to sit alone, but I didn't talk to anyone while I ate. Most of the guys didn't. For those men, there was a lot of solitude. Afterward, I sometimes watched TV. But mostly, I read a biography of Dwight Eisenhower that I found in the nursing home library where I was working. I loved that book. The idea that Eisenhower knew D-Day would probably be a calamity, but that he went ahead with it because he had no other choice. There was a quote of his that I've never forgotten. This probably isn't exactly it, but for me, it became sort of like a credo. We did what we could with what we had when we had it. I knew how anyone would see me. I was a guy lining up on the street for my dinner. I was a guy taking my wrinkly white button down shirt into the shower with me to wash it at night. I was one more homeless person hard on his luck, but I didn't feel hard on my luck. I felt like I was escaping from this crushing fate and that whatever happened was gonna be better than what I was leaving behind. I was escaping the idea that there was something wrong with me that I needed to take drugs, that even with the drugs, I couldn't trust my own judgment, that I was broken, that you're fucked, you're fucked, you're fucked, you're fucked. I thought, not for the first time, but this time it was a clear calculation. I'd rather be dead than be a broken person. And even though I had just been arrested, and even though I had just spent weeks on a psych ward for the second time, and even though I was going to be living indefinitely in a homeless shelter, this was better than the other narrative. That was a life I just did not want to live. Thank you. Um, I'd love to start broadly for those who haven't had a chance to read the book yet and pick up on the first part of your reading. Your brother, as you write, has... Um, had a decades long struggle with his mind. The struggle deepens in the 1980s. He, as you read, is eventually institutionalized. I'm hoping, could, could you talk about what was happening at that time in the 80s in American psychiatry and how um, your brother's experience started to shape what became your understanding of the psychiatric profession? Right, so there was a real convergence, personal and public psychiatric. So. Around the early 80s, psychiatry made a concerted effort to claim scientific objectivity. It was losing ground in various ways and in disarray in various ways, and it decided that to claim hard science as its approach was going to be it in a sense, salvation. Meanwhile, there have been developments on the pharmaceutical side, side, some of them going back to the 50s, but culminating around the same time and allowing psychiatry to prescribe medicines and to claim that these medicines could cure. I want to be careful. There is nothing in this book that proclaims medications aren't valuable, put your medications behind you, that would be grossly irresponsible and fully arrogant of me to maintain. Um, but what happened was my brother was having these struggles and he would, I should say now, after decades of a really flourishing life, which we should get to, my brother was having these struggles, being diagnosed in a way he would reject. My parents, my dad was a, a public health physician, my mom, a medical sociologist, so utterly rationalistic in their views, and terrified, as all parents are in this situation, clung to what they knew and what they were told. And what they were told is, if your son doesn't adhere to a heavy medication regimen, he's likely to take his own life. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, your parents, um, as you write, were great believers early on in what you call biological psychiatry, um, which you describe as the idea that the mind, like the body, can be broken in certain ways and that this brokenness can be repaired with pharmaceutical drugs. Uh, it seems that you were always skeptical. And as someone who's interested in reading about mental health, but not an expert, I mean, it seems to me like skepticism of the biological mo uh, model, even hostility towards psychiatry is sort of having a moment. You know, there's your book, there's a few others. Um, it seems like that moment sort of mirrors the turn against Freudianism um, that preceded it. At the same time, of course, more and more people are being prescribed psychiatric drugs. So I'm wondering how you understand um, that kind of tension. I think there really is a paradox at this moment. I do think we might be at a turning point. So a couple of indications. As I began this project, the New England Journal of Medicine published a lead opinion piece, which declared, as they put it, a crisis in both clinical and academic, that is research psychiatry, just saying, we don't know how these drugs work. We're making no progress in our medications. This can't be the only way to go. We need other approaches. And interestingly, as I set out, and unexpectedly to me, the people I was learning the brain science from and who'd spent their entire careers, multiple decades, searching for better pharmaceuticals were consistently saying, we haven't made progress in mm. 50 to 70 years, um, whether it's in antidepressants, antipsychotics, anti-anxiety medication. So there's that side of things that does suggest we might be at a turning point or at least at a deeply reflective point. On the other hand, you're absolutely right. I mean, we are prescribing more and more. We are diagnosing more and more. And just for one glaring example of that, the number of young people being diagnosed with bipolar over one recent decade increased by 40 times. It's worth just pausing on that a 40-fold increase in the diagnosis of bipolar disease. So again, even the most hardcore scientists who have devoted their lives to this biomedical mission were saying there's something going awry here. Yeah. I mean, certainly one of the shocking conclusions I came to reading your book was um, you know, there is just very little evidence for the efficacy of a lot of the drugs that are commonly prescribed for some of the basic models of, um, of psychiatry. Uh, you interviewed Mark Stone, who was a deputy director of the FDA's Division of Psychiatric Products. He did a meta-analysis that covered tens of thousands of subjects. He found that SSRIs used to treat depression do very close to nothing compared to a placebo. How is it, do you think, that these models have been able to persist in this field, supposedly devoted to science? How is it that these drugs um, that, that seem to work so, so, so poorly have become so popular? Right, so it's, on the one hand, the smartest thing to say is it's a mystery. On the other hand, it's worth acknowledging there are people who argue fiercely the other side of this. But yes, Mark's study, tens of thousands of subjects from within the FDA would suggest that SSIs outperform placebo for about 15% of people. And here's the new sort of revelation out of that research. We had thought that at least we could pinpoint who those limited people are who really do genuinely benefit and that it would be the severely depressed. That had been kind of the common wisdom, but his research calls even that into doubt so that yes, 15%, but it's very difficult to pinpoint or predict who that 15% will be. And yet here's you know what my New York Times Magazine editor has always asked me, she's like, how do you reconcile that data, which is pretty solid, with the anecdotal data that we all know that our friend, our family member was helped. I have family members who say, you know, I've gotten off it now, but that drug helped just lift up the bottom as the one person I'm thinking of 
uh, referred to it just of my psyche, just kept me from going lower than I was able to cope with. I don't have the answer, but the scientific answers are fairly consistent. Yeah. Well, you have a long discussion of the placebo effect and you talk about how culture sort of contributes to it. I mean, despite some very good evidence to the contrary, and obviously there's, there's evidence on both sides, we collectively believe that drugs like SSRIs work. And so it seems they, they work. I mean, is that, is that how you understand it as well? I think it's a variety of factors. So hope is a big factor that we're all subject to. Another one that's incalculable is just the attention of a practitioner or even a nurse who might be administering to subjects in a study. That is so powerful. And that brings us to a bigger you know, theme in the book, which is whether you're dealing with a very serious set of conditions, those that tend towards psychosis or severe bipolar, or whether you're dealing with a much more common set of conditions like depression that I won't say we all, but many, many of us uh, reckon with and deal with, it can be, connection can have a tremendous value. I mean, human connection. And so it may be that in those studies, what we're seeing is the effect of just even a brief doctor-patient, nurse-patient relationship. Mm-hmm. Mark Stone, the FDA director we just discussed, he, you write that he worried when he published this, um, his findings that they wouldn't be well-received, presumably not just by drug companies, but but by other psychiatrists. Do you see psychiatry as a self-critical profession? I mean, the the researchers you interviewed certainly um, have pointed to problems with the evidence, but does that trickle down to clinicians, do you think? I wonder. So I think many of us have had the experience of a clinician, the 15-minute visit that you walk away with your psychotropic medication for whatever the condition may be. And that's not a great indication of nuance, attention, individual thinking, et cetera. I'm somewhat hopeful just because the level of deep reflection and self-criticism was so powerful among a range of researchers that I spoke to. So again, when you think about turning points, we may well be at one. I mean, one of the really powerful moments for me as I spoke to one of the preeminent researchers into depression research who was now and for the past decade looking at this fascinating question of, I think we all know people who just seem so resilient against depression, like nothing gets to them. And sometimes that's just so frustrating, like how, how can you be so impervious to, you know, anything that the rest of us, you know, the darkness of the rest of us kind of at least touch upon, if not sometimes get submerged by. And he's looking at for brain mechanisms at the molecular level inside the neurons that might determine that kind of buoyancy. So he's a hard, hardcore scientist. But what he said to me is, look, when I started out my career in the early 80s, I thought cancer would be solved. And I thought psychiatric issues would solve right behind it. Well, Cancer is so dumbass simple, he said, compared to the issues we're dealing with. Of course, we haven't come too close to solving cancer. We've made progress. The other thing he taught me is this. From the 80s onward, and we're still living with this idea, we equated the brain with the mind. But the brain is not just another organ. So you take any other organ in the body, he said, and I can cut out a tiny piece of it and I can even take its individual cells and they're generally doing what the organ does. So if you go Google a heart cell, it will be pumping. Neurons, brain cells are not thinking. There are a hundred billion, a hundred trillion connections and somehow they are creating consciousness, the psyche, the self, but we have no idea how. And so to equate these things is just to merge together two things that are in completely different orders of magnitude, he would say. Mm -hmm. And it 
sort of led me to think about our minds in totally different ways, led me and has led scientists to think in spiritual terms that made some of those scientists uncomfortable, but nevertheless, they pursue those ideas. Um, but it's something to keep in mind. Brain and mind just aren't the same. Mm -hmm. Your book obviously looks at this maybe turn within psychiatry, but, but a lot of the book is um, devoted to patients, to um, people who have been treated by psychiatrists for a long time and who eventually struggle against their diagnoses or the treatment recommended for them. Um, I mean, presumably patients now have a lot more access to information about uh, the drugs they're on, about side effects, there's the internet. Um, do you feel like that's another kind of movement? Um, people who are diagnosed, who are recommended really serious drug reg regimens, ch challenging their doctors? Or is that something that's always existed? I don't think it's always existed nearly as much. Uh, and one evidence, bit of evidence for that is the sort of peer support movement where people with lived experience are involved in the treatment process and in meetings and in determining courses of treatment. But that's still fairly marginal. I think that more typical approach is you're in crisis and the psychiatrist comes in and says, this is the way to go. And partly the reason for that is we as a culture are so concerned with managing risk. So, and I do want to talk directly about this, but, you know, death, and it's good that you're my interlocutor because you thought a lot about this, but death, the possibility of death, however slim, overtakes the calculation. So the idea is I'm going to medicate you and that medication may severely sedate you. It may cause debilitating side effects, but it may help to simply keep you alive. It will may raise the odds of that. Now there's debate even about whether that's true, whether the long-term outcomes just in terms of life or death are improved, but that's the idea. And I think that really still determines the course that's taken. And just to give you a sense of how problematic some of these drugs are, I mean, we know the SSRIs have problematic side effects, particularly with drug companies never like to talk about, which is about 50% of people are affected sexually by the SSRIs in one way or another. But okay, we can say that's a calculation that people make and live with or adjust to, et cetera. On the antipsychotic side, and often bipolar kind of brings us toward antipsychotic drugs, even though it's a somewhat not, it's a blurry distinction. Um, on the antipsychotic side, those side effects can really, really, really be debilitating, massive weight gain, uncontrollable ticks. There's a billion dollar industry now of drugs to address those ticks. Even that only works, you know, some fraction of the time. Um, and just as evidence that this is problematic, 30 to 60% of patients will abandon their antipsychotics. Now, some would argue that's because those patients can't make decisions for themselves. They have no insight. They're denying their illness, as my brother did, and we can come back to that. But my experience is that much more often than not, if you sit there and listen long enough, people are more living in two worlds than living in an entirely in an alternate world. So there are moments of crisis that are exceptions to that. And that people, that 30 to 60% are probably voting with their feet and we should pay attention. We can't affirm all those decisions, but a lot of them are really worth mm -hmm. listening to. Yeah. Well, I wonder to what extent the healthcare infrastructure dictates treatment. As in, I would imagine in many situations, an insurance company will cover a prescribed medication, but not, you know, extensive talk therapy and some sort of inpatient treatment, different housing situation. Um, 
Is that what you were finding too? I mean, as you say, it's hard to let let someone live in two worlds if they potentially pose a risk, but there are places where they could probably do that safely. Yes, um, safely is always like, what is safe? I mean, hospitalization is safe for the two weeks you're there. You're mm -hmm. unlikely to have the wherewithal to do damage in that hospital, but is there anywhere near decent research to say that the outcomes are better after hospitalization than if you hadn't than if you hadn't been hospitalized there certainly is not and yes this insurance question is a big one so insurance will cover those prescription drugs will it cover a program like turning to the second major character of the book caroline who's suffered every imaginable onslaught of voices uh, that you can think of including very violent ones um she's leading a movement hearing voices movement and alternatives to thinking about suicide prevention movement and does that movement get support from either conventional psychiatry or the insurance industry no it doesn't i don't know that that's a matter of being profit oriented though certainly the pharmaceutical industry comes into play here but it's a matter of this is a really different way of thinking I'll give you a quick example. It's easier to talk about the suicide prevention movement because mm -hmm. uh, that's more straightforward. So, and again, caveat, I'm not speaking against calling a suicide hotline if you need help. I'm not, not, not doing that. But if you call a suicide hotline, the most heavily funded, federally funded one, you will think it's confidential, but in fact, someone is scoring your risk. And if you score high, you a police car or an ambulance will be sent to your door. And that happens about 20,000 times per year. Um, the idea being we are gonna move in coercively as a society in order and, and impose involuntary care to prevent death. Caroline's approach, this other movement, completely different. She's setting up groups across the country where the pact is no matter what you say you intend to do, no one will call 911 or, or a clinician for that matter. And the idea is that the more candid the sharing is and the more connected and the more understood you feel, the less likely you will be to take your own life. The, the calculation is it's isolation that finally leads often to suicide rather than you know, well, that, and, and what we need to do is to counter that isolation with a deep kind of connection. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about, pick up on that idea of involuntary care. Um, I mean, it happens all the time. Someone is forced to receive psychiatric treatment, maybe in a hospital uh, or in the context of a legal system, someone's declared medically, legally incapable of making decisions. Um, how has our understanding of, um, you know, capacity in in psychiatric patients or patients receiving psychiatric care? How has that changed in over time? Um, in what context can someone be forced to take pharmaceutical drugs for mental illness at this point? Well, the last question is easiest to answer so once you're out of the hospital of course it's very difficult to sure. force you you can't there are means to monitor it there's a program called aot assisted outpatient treatment here in new york that tries to monitor that and empowers family members to monitor it but it's difficult um i'm not sure that ideas of involuntary care really have changed that much there are legal protections that set limits on it but for instance in New York and San Francisco with the recent crises of violence that's attributed to the mentally ill, and I wanna be a little careful there, um, the response has been more psychiatric beds, more avenues for involuntary care. Um, those approaches will run into court problems for obvious reasons. Um, there can, it can be argued they're really impingements on human rights but that's been the response. So I'm not sure our culture has shifted that much, except that what we're seeing with movements like Caroline's, what we're seeing with peer movements, 
I went to Israel and visited at a place called a Sotiri house that can, you know, takes a, also a very progressive approach. Uh, when we're thinking about mental health in terms of the neurodiversity movement, which it, it does have some convergence with, then we're starting, I think, to see signs of reconceiving. And we're starting to see, for instance, former head for 13 years of the National Institute for Mental Health, Thomas Insel, uh, has been widely quoted as saying, you know, I spent $20 billion on all this amazing research. Have we moved the needle one bit in terms of suicide and hospitalizations? We have not. So that's one indication that people at the forefront of science are saying we need to rethink. Right. Sounds like a, it's a move away from suicide prevention at all costs. Um, right. It's a move yeah. away from let me hold on to you. I mean, one of Caroline's mottos is if I'm controlling, I'm not connecting. And mm -hmm. that's the problem. Like, go back to the parents. Go back to my parents. They needed to control. How could you need to do it and want to do anything else when your child is at risk? But the minute you're doing that, and Caroline's been through this, I mean, as I said, she's, you know, suffered all the symptoms that we would consider fearful, the minute you're doing that, you're unable to fully hear, you know, she would say, take your cape off. You mm -hmm. cannot fix this, yeah. but you can listen. And in that process, you can help to bring someone back. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to keep going here, but just a reminder to everyone that you can submit questions. We've had a few come in already. Um, I mean, your book talks about this push to prescribe medication. I'm wondering to what extent is what, what some people would refer to as an over-prescribing problem, to what extent is that an American problem? So, um, I mean, you, you, you give a really interesting example, looking back to the 1950s, you're talking about the, the growth of a market for so-called minor tranquilizers in the U.S. This was um, like, you know, initially an American phenomenon. You talk about the introduction of Thorazine as psychiatry's, you know, first big pharmaceutical breakthrough in the 50s. Um, what I found fascinating was that in the United States, the drug was marketed as a treatment for mania. It was understood as something that would make patients more relaxed. In Canada, it was understood as a chemical lobotomy, as something, you know, far more serious. Um, so yeah, I'm wondering to what extent this, this is a problem in the United States compared to other countries. So... Again, I just want to say, since the publication of the book and an excerpt in the New York Times Magazine, I've received a lot of nice comments, but also some comments which we need to note from people who've really suffered and really stand by medication. Um, but in answer to your question, there does seem to be a particular American hunger for the quick fix that pharmaceuticals professed to supply. Um, dosages have been particularly high here, particularly of antipsychotics. Um, and there are some indication that even rates of diagnosis and rates of prescription are higher. So there's interesting studies showing, you know, same uh, actors sent out, same symptoms across several countries receiving much higher rates of diagnosis and prescription here than in countries in Europe. ADHD, to just take a quick detour, depending on the study, up to 10 times more prevalently prescribed here than in a country like France. Other studies have it at two to one, but no one has it at, at an equal rate. Yeah, there seems to be something about us. There's also, Side note here, in the early studies, particularly of, of Thorazine, which was the first antipsychotic in the 50s, there were just wild claims, but those claims emerged from seemingly rigorous studies such that 90% of subjects were either completely cured or almost fully cured. That's no one would claim that now for any antipsychotic, whether the old form, which is 
Thorazine, now Dolan, or the newer forms known as second generation antipsychotics. No one would claim anything close to that, but somehow that study, which sort of held the argument for quite a while, was able to make that claim and was also reported to have found side effects that were fairly minimal, bad dreams, nasal congestion. Now this has nothing to do with, and I mean really emphatic ticks. So you feel Caroline felt like she was losing control of her body. So there was a dissonance there that's hard to explain. Yeah. I mean, you, we've talked already about the faith that clinical psychiatrists have had in some of these in drugs and how, how some researchers are starting to question that faith. I'm wondering about the consumer side of things. You write that in the 1980s, federal laws were loosened. They let uh, drug companies advertise drugs directly to consumers, something that only one other nation, New Zealand, allows. Um, I mean, I worked <laughs> for a few years in American broadcast television. I would memorize different advertisements for diabetes drugs and, and whatever it was. I mean, they're on all the time. This history of marketing directly to patients, do you think that has contributed in a significant way to the popularity of some of these drugs? Is it that American consumers are demanding them more maybe than in other places? Yeah, I think there's possibly a kind of circularity that is psychiatrists are diagnosing and prescribing with maybe unwanted, unwarranted emphasis, but certainly that then there's a, a demand um, and mm -hmm. drug companies have known this certainly since the 50s when they started marketing some of those quote mild tranquilizers um yeah and the on the uh unnamed morning news show that i tend to watch there are an inevitable stream of drugs both marketed for primarily bipolar and then because those bipolar drugs often cause movement disorders, tics, et cetera, there's a steady stream of advertising for drugs that can, in some cases, counter those movement disorders. So yeah, and that's prime time. So yeah. there's, you can imagine how much money is being spent on those campaigns. Yeah. I want to ask you about deinstitutionalization. So the move away from offering in treatment you know, from in-treatment psychiatric facilities. I mean, deinstitutionalization is seen as by many people as a successful movement in the United States that, um, you know, patients prefer to be treated in community. Um, when I was reporting for my book, I went to a few countries in Europe like Belgium and was surprised to find that the institution, I mean, they're moving away from institutionalization, but, but still these institutions are common. I met young people in their twenties and thirties who'd spent time as children in psychiatric facilities. Um, how do you understand that deinstitutionalization trend in the U S is it all positive? Have we lost something? You know, I didn't have a chance to spend time as you did in European institutions. Um, like I said, I did think a lot about in alternative institutions, but those are really experimental, open door. Um, so I don't think anyone really argues that deinstitutionalization itself, which happened in the wake of Thorazine and Haldol, so 60s up till kind of the Reagan era, was in itself a mistake. What people do argue is that there wasn't the funding to build the community level services that were supposed to come in and take the place of those institutions. So I don't think we should have a rush back to institutions. I know we're in fear. I mean, shootings yesterday, I mean, shootings on the subway, San Francisco, that feeling of kind of anarchy all of that raises questions. I don't think the answer is reinstitutionalization. I think it is though, and even fairly mainstream people would say this. So I spent some time talking to the new head of the Department of Health here in New York, whose entire background is in mental health. And even he, though he's a relatively centrist mayor's Department of Health director, was saying, we really need to think upstream. We need to think 
not about the crisis moment. At that point, we're dealing with a criminal situation. We need to think way upstream about why people are abandoning their medication. That's number one. And number two is how can we, whether on medication or not, how can we battle the isolation, which is really haunting. You can imagine if you're hearing voices, you're, I mean, I, for me, I'm careful. I mean, many people just call these alternate realities and I'm drawn to that idea, but whatever we want to call them, psychosis, you know, non-consensus realities, these are situations that since childhood have brought shame, isolation, self-laceration, et cetera. And you can imagine what years and years and years of that does. And his point, Dr. Fassan's point was, look, we just need to focus on the beginnings if we're gonna avert the terrible endings. Yeah. I'm about to throw up into questions from the audience, but as my concluding question, um, you know, Daniel, when we spoke on the phone last week, you talked about an earlier New America meeting um, uh, in which, uh, at which you were asked, you know, what would you do as a parent if your child was diagnosed with a mental illness and, and strong psychiatric drugs were, were recommended? I mean, your book with a lot of caveats, with a lot of care is skeptical of biological psychiatry. Um, but, you know, as you write, you know, some of your characters, they started hearing voices and, and dealing with um, psychosis, at, at, you know, as children. So I, I, you, you told me that at that time you didn't really have an answer to the question. That's fair. It's a, it's a really hard question. But I wonder if you have a more concrete idea now of what you might do. Yeah, the question that stumped me actually raised the stakes even further. What, what would you do if you had a child who was talking about suicide? Mm. And for good reason, didn't have an answer. But I think what I've learned here is maybe to advise against all the terror that I know from my parents and from parents who've written me since is to advise for at least a um, sort of metaphoric moment, taking a breath. What's being said to you? Can you afford to just listen? Would listening, just listening help? I know this sounds trite and simplistic, but I can say from my brother's experience, and it's an N of one, but it's but I've done enough research over the last several years to have an end far beyond that. That the minute, especially with a relatively grown child, a teen, a young adult, the minute you put that person on a locked ward, you are communicating something that might be damaging. And I think for my brother, try as he did, try as we all did, that relationship with our parents was never quite healed. It's an entirely different thing, I should say, if that child, and I know many people like this, asks him or her or themselves for that respite of hospitalization. I think that's an entirely different script with an entirely different, I would guess, outcomes. Yeah. But I would go back to what Caroline, who has so much experience with this, says, and people can read. She's now so involved with outreach. The book contains a lot of her conversations with parents. That the more we control, the less we connect. And just, I would say to parents, just at least keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to turn now to some of the questions we've been getting from audience members. Um, uh, an anonymous viewer asked, um, how do psychedelic treatments for various mental health problems fit into the landscape you describe? Yeah, so they do. And it's really interesting. This is going to bring us a uh, war trigger warning if people are really, really adamantly atheistic. This is going to bring us into some spiritual territory. So there have the New York Times, my paper, recently trumpeted the psychedelic revolution. And it, and it fascinatingly, uh, linked to two major studies, saying that both have been successful. That is not true. And if you just go to the conclusion sections, you'll see it. One of them was not successful, and one of them definitely was. And I really burrowed deep. A clear difference between the two is that the successful study offered, I want to say, 
30, but it may have been way more than that, hours of therapy. And that therapy, as you can learn if you read the therapy manual, is very particular. And this is where we get in the spiritual. It talks about guiding the person toward a sense of self within one's surroundings and a sense of, quote, oneness. Uh, it is all about using the psychedelic as an opportunity to position oneself within something larger, whatever we want to call that something larger, the cosmos, the higher power. You know, we can go to Eastern or Western terms here. But it's fascinating to me that I think that is one of the places that psychiatric researchers interested in and moving in. One of the key researchers in that area apologized to me. She's like, again, as hardcore as it gets in her background, she said, I'm about to get woo woo on you. And she spoke about this spiritual aspect. So did the researcher I mentioned earlier, the, the depression researcher. He, he's, he would never say he's religious. He draws a clear line between science and religion. He just said, I'm fascinated by what it is. What's the ingredient for religious people that seems to help them. And he just said it may be the ability to find order or the ability to find meaning because one is placing oneself within something larger. Uh-oh, Katie, I'm not hearing you now. Oh, and then oh yeah. We, there we go, yeah, okay, sorry. good. Um, uh, I have a question from another anonymous viewer. Have there been advancements in the prevention of mental health problems and crises as opposed to diagnosis and treatment? Wait, so what was the first part before the diagnosis and treatment? In the prevention of mental health ah, problems as opposed to diagnosing and treatment. Yeah, I mean, I would say, again, these are not rigorously studied, but I would say that you know, this whole idea about finding ways to connect, I'd say this idea that I just referred to about finding meaning in something larger. Um, there is a little bit of research about things like diet um, that might help. Certainly for my brother, and this is important to note, uh, you know, he adheres to a pretty strict regimen of meditation, prayer, exercise, and for him, because he's a musician, music. Those four things begin his day, and it would be difficult to sway him from that. That is a really centering, or those are really centering forces in his life. And I think if you think about those four things, you'll find you know at least one of them as themes in ideas about prevention. Um, kind of going off that point, Kelvin asks, what structural changes within our healthcare system today are important for us to address in order to support a relationship-based approach to psychiatry? Right. So um, I might not be smart enough structurally to answer that question, but I will say that humility would be a substructural element. So I'm thinking of Steve Hyman, who uh, arguably is one of maybe even the leading scientists in, in psychiatric research. He's a psychiatric geneticist. He ran the National Institute of Mental Health for many years. He's now head of psych research at the Broad Institute, which is a Harvard MIT uh, organization. And what he called for after years and years and years of research was epistemological humility. We don't know, we don't know. And that can sound like a nihilistic starting point. He didn't mean it that way at all. He's a scientist, he's gonna to continue to pursue the science of psychiatry. Um, but he felt like starting from not knowing rather than an assertion of expertise might be the way to go. It allows that doctor-patient relationship to be individualized in a way that we just haven't really done institutionally, systematically. Now, I'll just add one caveat to that. Of course, science can't institutionalize to a complete degree. 
science classifies, right? And without classifications and categorizations, it's lost. It can't study anything. But I think Hyman's idea, and the idea of others was, if you can push back toward the individualization of clinical practice, and perhaps even there's a way to do this at the level of research, we might find new and better methods. David Rubin's question kind of follows off that point. He would like to know, um, you talked about Carolyn who said that we cannot connect when we are trying to control. Are you optimistic that more people will learn this skill? I guess are you optimistic that there'll be this turn towards more of a relationship-based model? Right. So people hear about what I'm writing about, and this happens not only with this book, but with others, and think I'm a really dark person. I'd say more that I'm just comfortable in dark places, and that's different than being terribly pessimistic. I actually do think so, and that's been affirmed. So the recent excerpt in the New York Times Magazine has drawn just a huge amount of traffic, and some of it's been very critical, and some of it's been wrenchingly critical. Like I've watched one particular video. I'll tell everyone, if you Google Freddie DeBoer, you will hear everything that is wrong with the story I've told, and it is worth listening to. Um, but that said, there have been a lot of people who've written back in very, very thoughtful ways. So yes, I'm optimistic. Another anonymous reader had asked um, if any of the responses to your book, or I guess to the, to the Times excerpt, have surprised you. Yeah, the fierceness of Freddie DeVore's response caught me by surprise, even though I knew that sort of thinking was out there. He's someone who's really suffered and is clearly in pain right now and who I'd love to connect with. I don't know if he will want to connect with me. Um, so that took me by surprise. Um, no, I'd say after all the years of doing this and then all the years, decades of thinking about it um, ever since the early 80s, no, I wouldn't say surprise. It's not surprise. It's more like each response just deepens my understanding. So I love getting those responses. I hope readers will just go to my website, get my email and send me their thoughts. That's a kind of connecting I love that deepens my experience as a writer. Another question just came in, which I think um, I'd like to ask, um, and, and, and you touched on it earlier, but um, uh, the anonymous viewer would like to know, can you tell us the rest of your brother's story as he got better? You know, I'm always torn because I'd like people to read <laughs> the book. Um, can I just say my brother's story, I think is both a lesson and really, really moving. Um, sometimes when I read that passage about his being homeless, I get choked up because at that point in our lives, so we maintained a lot of close contact, I'd kind of checked out. Maybe it was too much for me to deal with. Um, so there's a lot of transformative story that follows, and I'm going to leave it at that for now. Okay. We are approaching the end of our time here. Um, you know, your book charts these, these different sort of revolutions in psychiatry from pre-Freudian times to Freud, its biological model. Um, you say that you're an optimistic person, but of course, the brain is a complex organ. I'm wondering, do you feel like we're, you know, psychiatry will kind of crack it or at least make significant advances in our lifetimes? Um, or do you feel like the move forward is to become, as, as you said earlier, more humble um, with the limitations of the profession? So look, my mind's reeling back to the enlightenment <laughs> and we don't have enough time for that lecture, but ever since the Enlightenment, it's interesting, we've thought that we could somehow excise mental illness from the brain or rebalance the brain in current terms where we think about, you know, balancing out chemical imbalances and rectifying them. And in many ways, the Enlightenment 
created the world we live in. It created checks and balances. It created the country we live in. It has in its faith in rationalistic, materialistic science hasn't fully been borne out. And that's not to say that that science isn't fascinating. I could sit all day and did many days with those scientists who are looking at how our realities are created. I mean, Don Goff, who's ultimately, he and I, you know, kind of agree to disagree, but I mean, he was an amazing teacher showing me that it's not the frontal areas of the brain alone that create consciousness, it's the hippocampus and just leading me deep into the brain, primitive areas of the brain, absolutely fascinating. But in answer to your question, Katie, I, I, I'm not sure we can crack it. There's not, you know, we've been trying to crack it for a very, very, very long time. I think we will make incremental process, but I guess I find something affirming in knowing that the self is beyond cracking. I think that's um, a nice note for us to end on. Daniel, it was a pleasure to speak, a real pleasure to read your book. I'll remind everyone watching that there should be a link at the bottom of your screen that will allow you to buy the book, understand what all the controversy is about. Um, but thank you, Daniel. Thank you to New America. And I will throw this back to, to the organizers. Thanks, Katie.